Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Sabbath day was a day of public prayer for the Jews, as Sunday is for us, for the Christians. And although Jesus frequently went off into the desert for solitude and silence and spending whole nights in prayer, he did not shun the common prayer in the synagogue with the people. St. Luke says in another place that it was Jesus' custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. That was his practice. That's what he did. That's where you'd find him. Today we hear proud words from friends who say, I don't need to go to church to pray. I can just stay at home. But Christ's personal example is both to pray in secret and to attend the public assembly of the community. And Jesus did not only go to the synagogue to pray, he went there to teach, as we see what he did today. He interpreted the scriptures, giving wonderful teachings, most not even recorded in the Gospels. We have plenty. Whatever we have in the Gospels is enough for us, for wisdom, for salvation, everything we need. But he was doing this as his custom, like the regular way. This is where he went. This is what he did. But he didn't only go to the synagogue to teach, pray, or teach. He also went for moments like the one recorded today in the gospel, seizing the right moment in someone's life to not only teach on the scripture, but to teach something even like larger in the lives of everyone there. So we're going to look at the, the, what happened in the synagogue on the Sabbath with this woman. We're going to look at it like on two levels. One, kind of the surface level, like we have in the gospel. What happened? What, who said what to whom kind of thing? And then also the interpretation of that from the church. Like, what does that mean for us? So this is what happened. He goes to the synagogue, Jesus does. He finds a woman who has been uh, in a contorted, twisted shape of her body, bent over so that she was always looking down at her knees. She couldn't see the faces of people. She couldn't see the face. She couldn't see the sky. She was bent like a twisted tree, this woman. And Jesus goes there and he sees her, but he doesn't see her as others did, which is a twisted tree or something. He sees her as the daughter of Abraham, it says. He sees in her a woman who needs her dignity restored by having her body healed. And she's in the right place. She went to the synagogue on the Sabbath with obvious pain and discomfort to be bent over like that so long. I've had a crick in my neck for years now. You know, they're constantly getting it worked on and stuff. Hers is a billion times worse, you know? And there she is. And Jesus looks at her and he calls out, Woman, you're freed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and she was immediately made straight and praised God. Note that Jesus did not work this miracle at her request. He did not work this miracle because she was shouting out like the man last week in the gospel, the blind man by the road who kept screaming out, you know, son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody's like, stop the screaming. You know, enough with the annoying act you're putting on here. This is the opposite. One, she's in the synagogue. The blind man in Jericho is on the road. But the other thing that's different is she doesn't cry out. She's just there on the Sabbath. He looks at her with compassion, calls her woman instead of, you know, crippled person or something. Instead of a put down or instead of seeing just like her body and, and judging that, he looks at her and sees a woman who's in need. And calls her out and gives her everything she'd been deprived of for 18 years. But the gospel reading doesn't end there. One would expect that the ruler of the synagogue, if we put it in our terms, the pastor and the parish council would be pretty excited to have something like this happen at their place. And that's not what happens here. It says this. It says this. 
The ruler of the synagogue was indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the people, in a passive-aggressive way, although that's not what it says in Scripture. <laughs> you know, he's mad at Jesus for doing this. And it says, he said to the people, there are six days on which work is to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath. He basically gets on to Christ by yelling at the people for just showing up on the Sabbath sick. <laughs> These really are wicked words of darkness from the synagogue ruler. Don't, don't miss it. You know, Jesus works a miracle of a woman who'd been distorted, like twisted up, and he just heals her without her even asking. It's no one's fault. In fact, the only person to be blamed here is Jesus, and he's indignant with Jesus, and he gets onto the people, and Jesus, he doesn't really stand for it. He's not going to let it go. St. Nikolai of Zicha, who we keep quoting, I keep quoting, he says that it's as though Satan left the twisted woman and went into the synagogue ruler. It's pretty powerful. This self-centered ruler doesn't dare to rebuke Christ, so he gets onto the people, and Jesus, who called her out and healed her, is the only guilty person there, guilty of healing someone loving someone, having compassion on someone, acting. So this is what Jesus says to the ruler. You hypocrite. You always think of Jesus as being like, you know, Christmas Jesus, you know, sweet and infant and mild, you know, and peaceful. And, but he just won't stand for this. You hypocrite. This is what he says. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie your cattle, you know, your oxes and donkeys and whatever? Don't you do that on the Sabbath and let them go drink? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, there's that line, Satan bound for 18 years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? Ah, you know, and then here's the great story here. As Jesus said this, all his adversaries are put to shame, and the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. The Lord knew that the ruler was really rebuking him for healing this woman, even though he was getting on the people. And the Lord, who is brighter than the sun, Jesus does not have this kind of action, and he just says what's true in love to people. And the ruler didn't have that. He just decided to get on to Jesus. Jesus calls him a hypocrite. And Satan, saying Satan had bound this woman for 18 years. That she was bent over because some kind of... Satan had bound this woman's head to her knees. She was bent over. And in the same way, the synagogue ruler was bound by Satan to the Sabbath. Like, Satan had both of them. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than the Sabbath. The ruler of the synagogue is standing there before the ruler of souls. Did you hear that? The synagogue ruler is standing there before the ruler of souls. And he doesn't see that. All he sees is that somebody's messing with his, with his thing. You know, someone's gotten in the way of something here. You know? What he wanted to have happen. Instead of just saying, well, let's see what Jesus will do today. He wanted Jesus to do what he wanted him to do. So that's the surface level. The interpretation, kind of like, where does it apply to us, this other level of the inner meaning, meaning of things? And uh, this actually comes from text messages I've been receiving from Jesse Robinson. Because he's preaching on this in his seminary assignment in uh, Pennsylvania. So I give him a little credit here, because I'm stealing this from him. Um, and I'm glad it's recorded, so if he watches this, he'll know I gave him his due. Um, Jesse is studying confession and other things at seminary, and he circled a line in his book and took a picture of it and texted it to me. 
And it says that when the penitent comes up for confession and kneels for the confession, they stand up for the prayers. And we know that Jesus told his disciples that whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And the church takes that and applies it to what happens in confession. Not that the priest has power to loose the sins, but the priest serves as a witness and reminds the penitent. I keep pointing to where we do confession here. Uh, the priest's job as a witness is to remind the one confessing, the penitent one, that the Lord has forgiven them their sins and that they are loosed of whatever had bound them. The same way the woman was bent over in a kneeling place, bound by Satan, the burden of that sin or whatever was on her is made right. It says she stood upright, straight. It's the exact same action that happens in confession. We come to confession burdened. We come to confession guilty. We come to confession like worried and strained and exhausted. We come to confession just with a thing going on in the back of our minds. I've done something that was not mine to do. I've said things I should not have said. I should have spoken but didn't. I was silent when I should have said something. I've looked at things I should not have looked at. And on and on and on and on and on. Every day of our lives. And we kind of put things out of our minds. And yet it's still there twisting our minds. The way the woman's body was twisted. It just twists our minds around. So now we think things that we shouldn't think. We have attitudes we should not even go there. Moods that are too luxurious for us to own. You know, they're beyond us and yet we have them all the time. So that we can be angry with drivers. They're just driving. You know, I got cut off yesterday driving here for the bake sale. I'm like, what did I do to that guy? I, I really don't think I did anything to that guy. But we just have all these things that happen to us all day long, every minute, and they work on us. They work on us. Some things are big enough that they really, we got to go confess. But all these things are going, and we need to confess them. We see this woman. She's in the church. Jesus calls her out, and when he does, she's restored. She's made upright. Made to stand. A paralyzed mind, a twisted mind, come up with all kinds of reasons not to go to confession. Just tons of reasons. And we all do this, varying degrees. And we do not want to miss the opportunity to be where the Lord is and to be restored. To have that stuff in us called out so that we might stand upright again with Him. That our minds might be restored. The way they think might be restored. And we're talking about the mind, we're not talking about the brain. Just so we're all clear. The brain where all the electricity is firing across synapses and all that stuff that's happening and breathing happens and arm movements and whatever the brain is controlling. We're talking about the mind, the soul of the person, the heart of the person, where the Lord resides, can get all twisted by sin. Let us not hold back. Let us not resist. Let us come to the Lord and confess so that we might stand upright. That we might stand upright. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.